this set of notes, we're going to continue our discussion of confidence intervals. So previously we looked at how to construct confidence intervals using bootstrap distributions. Now we're going to look at how to construct confidence intervals using formulas. So just like before, we talked about how in statistics we don't just present a point estimate as an estimate of the parameter. We want to provide some information about the margin of error. So we usually present what's called an interval estimate or a confidence interval. And so a confidence interval is a rule specifying the method for using the sample measurements to calculate two numbers that form the end points of an interval. And so we have some desirable properties of an interval. You know, ideally we would like it to contain the target parameter. We recognize that it may not, especially with confidence intervals, but we would like that. And we would like it to be relatively narrow. So a confidence interval is an interval that contains theta with a fairly high probability. And so here is our probability statement. And be very careful with these probability statements because people often get confused. The big idea here is that theta is fixed. So theta, the parameter, is not a random piece, but theta hat, the estimator, is random. So when we write our probability statements this way, when we talk about the random component, these two pieces are both random, whereas that middle piece, theta, the parameter, is fixed. So we're not saying this is the probability that theta falls within this interval. This is more the probability that the interval covers theta. And so there is a big difference there. So in general, there are different types of confidence intervals we could construct. We could construct a two-sided confidence interval. In the two-sided confidence interval, we have two random components, the lower and the upper bound. In a lower confidence in limit, we only have the lower bound that's random. The upper bound, pardon me, in this case would be infinity. And then in an upper confidence limit, only the upper limit is random because the lower limit goes to infinity. And then the confidence coefficient, that is our amount of confidence. So for example, if we were interested in calculating a 95% confidence interval, alpha would be equal to 0 0.05. All right. So here's what the probability statements would look like for the two different one-sided confidence intervals. And then further, the confidence coefficient identifies the fraction of the time in repeated sampling that the interval constructed will contain the target parameter theta. So again, this is going back to that idea that the confidence interval is the thing that is random, not the parameter. And we'll talk about this a little bit more when we talk about the meaning of confidence. And then we know that the confidence coefficient associated with our estimator is high. We can be highly confident that any confidence interval constructed using the results from a single sample will enclose theta. All right, so there are several large sample confidence intervals that you have probably seen in the past. So we had this table back in module eight that listed some parameters of interest. So notice in this column here, we have the different parameters. We have a specified sample size and we have the estimator. We have the estimator's expected value as well as its standard deviation. So remember that the standard deviation, this had to deal with the sampling distribution and what it does is it tells us about the variability of that estimator. So if we want to construct an interval, we need to account for that variability. Also recall that by the central limit theorem, we know that if z is equal to theta hat minus theta divided by its standard error, in other words, we're subtracting off the mean and dividing by the standard deviation of that estimator, that is going to have an approximate standard normal distribution if the sample sizes are large enough. So let's consider a generic estimator theta. Notice the expected value of, pardon, estimator theta hat. Notice the expected value of theta hat is equal to theta, so it is an unbiased estimator. And let's construct a confidence interval for theta. Now, recall that we know from up above, we know that if z is equal to theta hat minus theta divided by sigma of theta hat, we know this is approximately normal 0, 1. So in other words, what we can do is we can construct a probability statement for z. z is a random variable. And if we think of what that sampling distribution for z would look like, we know that it's centered at 0. And what we do when we construct a confidence interval, what we're saying is let's put 0.5 
1 minus alpha um, proportion or percent of the area between those two endpoints. So if we want to make a 95% confidence interval, we would put 95% of the area in the center. And what we would be interested in are these two endpoints A and B. We are going to make this a symmetric interval. So if we know that this is a standard normal distribution, then notice that these endpoints are going to be Z probably negative z alpha divided by 2 and z alpha divided by 2. Alright, so we can write a probability statement that we know the probability that z, our random variable, is between the endpoints negative z alpha divided by 2 and z alpha divided by 2, that's going to be equal to 1 minus alpha. And again, this comes directly from this diagram. Now notice if we're creating a confidence interval, we really don't want an interval where we have z in the center. What we really want is an interval that has the parameter of interest. But notice that z, and that should have been an equal sign there, is a function of theta. Theta is part of you know when we calculate z. So what we can do is let's rewrite this as the following. Oops. And now we can see that it would be fairly easy to get theta by itself in the center. And so I'll have you show that on your own, but you should find the following. Oh, I should have had greater than or equal on each of these. So notice what we have here. We have that theta is in between these two values. And if you look closely at these two values, they should look fairly familiar. Notice really what we've got is we've got the statistic plus the margin of error. And on this side, we have the statistic minus the margin of error. So this is that justification for that formula for confidence intervals that you've seen you know, over and over, which is the statistic plus or minus the margin of error, where the margin of error takes both into account the sampling distribution as well as um, our level of confidence. And so notice we can use this to create many, many different types of confidence intervals. So for example, we could let theta be equal to p, or we could let theta be equal to mu1 minus mu2. So this generic form works for lots of different statistics and really what it depends on for the, this particular form is this piece right here. And if you'll remember, lots of statistics follow this format by the central limit theorem. All right, so here's just a couple facts about confidence intervals. So let's look at an example and use this to find a 95% approximate confidence interval for mu if n is greater than or equal to 30. So notice since n is greater than or equal to 30, we know that the central limit theorem is going to apply. And from the previous page, we know that a 100 times 1 minus alpha percent confidence interval is given by theta hat plus or minus z alpha divided by 2 sigma theta hat. So in this particular case, since we're going to work with a mean from a single sample, we're going, to know, we're going to let theta hat be equal to y bar, because again, we're interested in that mean. And we know from previous note sets 
that if we want the standard deviation of y bar, that is equal to sigma divided by the square root of n. So therefore, the confidence interval is equal to y bar plus or minus z alpha divided by two sigma over the square root of n. And this is a confidence interval that you saw many, many times in your um, intro stat course. A couple things to note here is if we wanted a 95% confidence interval, z alpha um, divided by two would be equal to 1.96. And if we don't know sigma, we could use s if n is large enough. And so that's why we have this approximate confidence interval here. So the 95% approximate interval is given by y bar plus or minus 1.96 times s divided by the square root of n. Alright, let's look at some more examples where we can apply this. So we have a recent study investigated the effects of the Buckle Up Your Toddlers campaign to get parents to use a grocery cart seatbelt. Investigators observed a simple random sample of parents in a large city and found 192 out of 594 parents buckling up their toddlers. So we're going to start out by finding a 90% confidence interval for the proportion of all parents who buckle up their toddlers using the grocery store seat belts. So just a couple of things to note here before we get started. Notice that n is equal to 594. We also know that our statistic p hat in this case is equal to 192 divided by 594. One thing to note here is p hat is a special type of mean. So we can use the central limit theorem if our sample size is large enough. And so if you'll remember with proportions, we had those checks that said, you know, your number of successes and failures had to be above, um, I believe it was 10 in our notes, but I've seen anywhere from five, 10 to 15. Obviously we have much more than that for any of those um, general rules of thumb. So we're good, we can apply the central limit theorem. So one thing to remember is we had that generic form for the interval. And now we can apply this for a proportion. So our statistic is p hat. We're still gonna have z alpha divided by two, but now we need the standard deviation of that statistic, and that's where we could use that table from our, the previous page. So now we just need to plug in our values. get an interval of 0 0.2917 to 0 0.3548. Next we can interpret the interval. So we have, we are 90% confident the proportion of all parents who buckle up their toddlers is between 0 0.029 and 0 0.035. And then of course we could have said percentage instead of proportion and given the percentages there. All right, so we have another example. So this one says in a study of women science majors, the following data were obtained in two, on two groups, those who left their profession within a few months after graduation, leavers, and those who re remained in their profession after they graduated, and we're gonna call those the stayers. So the first thing we need to do is find a 99% confidence interval for the difference in the mean grade point average for the two groups. So if we were going to use the format that we saw earlier, our interval would be the following. 
So notice here, we are going to have to estimate those sigmas with S using this information right here. Our Y bars are given here, and then our ends are our ends are going to be here. So this is going to be an approximate interval and remember that in both cases we need our sample size to be at least 30 to apply the central limit theorem which we do have. Now one thing to note here is you may recall from your um, intro stats course that if you're working with means and you have to use the sample standard deviation you probably would use a t distribution. So remember here we're just showing that application of the central limit theorem and the construction of these large sample confidence intervals and these are approximate intervals. Um, in practice it would be better to use a t distribution for these. So but if you plug in those numbers you should find the following interval. All right. So in terms of the next question, it says based on your answers to A, is there significant evidence that the mean GPA for the leavers differs from the mean GPA of the stayers? Why or why not? Well notice we are 99% confident of the following. So the first thing to notice here is notice that I am not putting a probability statement on it on this and the reason for that is there's nothing here that is random. Mu1 minus mu2 is fixed and then of course the other two values are just numbers. The probabilistic portion actually comes in with this word confident and so by saying we're 99% confident we're placing the randomness on the intervals and this is the interval that we actually observed so at this point we actually don't have anything that is random. But notice this means it's plausible that mu1 minus mu2 is equal to zero. Therefore, we cannot conclude that there's a significant or that there is significant evidence that the mean GPA for the levers differs from the mean GPA for the stayers when alpha is equal to 0.01. So this is alluding to that relationship between confidence intervals and hypothesis tests. We haven't formally talked about hypothesis tests yet, but do know that there is a relationship between the two. The next portion says find a 95% confidence interval for the difference in the mean grade point average for the two groups. So the only difference between this one and part A is we would use Z equal to 1.96. So we would use the exact same formula and if you plug in those values you would find the following. And so in part D we say based on your answer is there significant evidence that the mean GPA for the levers differs from the mean GPA for the stayers, why or why not? Well notice in this case we're only 95% confident so we've reduced our level of confidence but now we do have evidence that they differ because that entire interval lies below zero. This is one reason um, that it's so important if you are going to use a significance level you know, and, and calculate a confidence interval you have to. It's important to specify that before you ever look at your data. So in other words if you choose to use 99% confidence or 95% confidence that should be completely independent of your data. So when you report these. This also relates to the idea of in hypothesis testing and I'll talk more about this later on. Um, there's been this movement that instead of reporting the p-value and we say that relationship to alpha that we actually just report what the p-value is and it's for reasons like this. When we see at the 99% confidence level uh, we actually contain zero but the 95% we don't. Alright so let's just talk a little bit about the meaning of confidence intervals and this is again going to go back to that idea that the interval is the random piece not the parameter. So we derived this formula earlier on and so really we want to look at this as two different pieces. We have the middle portion in the probability statement and we have the two endpoints. Each of these pieces are the random, 
and the parameter in the middle is fixed. So we, here we have that previous example where we looked at the difference in means. However, once we've collected all of our data and we substitute in those values, and we get this 95% confidence interval that we saw before, it's no longer makes sense to have that probability statement. And this is what I was talking about earlier. There's nothing random once we actually calculate the interval. So we cannot conclude that mu1 minus mu2 is in this interval 95% of the time. That would suggest that mu1 minus mu2 is random. So really, again, when we say what we're 95% confident, what does that actually mean? What it's saying is that if we repeat the same procedure 100 times and we get 100 different values and calculate 100 different confidence intervals using this formula, then approximately 95% of those intervals will contain the true unknown value of mu1 minus mu2. So again, the random piece is the interval and it's random before we use the data. Once we use the data, our interval is fixed. It is what it is. This goes back to the same idea as the difference between an estimator as an, and an estimate. Remember that an estimator was random, but the estimate calculated from the data was not random. All right, one other thing we're going to look at here is selecting sample size. So sometimes we want to specify the width of the confidence interval. So let's go back to that buckle up your toddlers example. Remember that we had that formula for the confidence interval. So if we wanted to find the sample size, let's say we wanted to find the sample size needed to obtain an error of estimation that is this small. And so it's referring to this piece up here, the error of estimation to be less than 0.005 with probability 0 0.90. So recall that here we have the formula for the confidence interval. So what we're saying is we want the margin of error, which is equal to z alpha divided by 2 times the square root of pq divided by n, to be less than 0 0.005. So what we could do is we could solve for n. So the first thing we're going to do is we're going to compute what sample size we would need if we use 0.32 as an estimate for p. So again, we're going to assume that p is approximately 0.32. That comes from uh, the example and the data that we saw earlier. So to do this, what we have is 1.645 times the square root of 0 0.32 times 1 minus 0 0.32 divided by n and that is going to be less than 0.005. So next, what we would then do is we would solve for n. And so I'll leave you to confirm that on your own, but we find that we get 23,553.2 is less than n, so this suggests we need at least 23,554 subjects in the sample. So we could compute the sample size assuming no prior knowledge for p. So remember that we had shown before that the variance of p hat is maximized when p is equal to a half. So we're going to do the exact same thing that we just did, except now we're going to do this when p is equal to 0.5. So doing the same thing as earlier, we're going to have 1.645 times the square root 0.5 times 1 minus 0.5 divided by n is less than 0 0.005. And again, take a moment on your scrap paper, see if you can solve for n. Here, we're going to see that n needs to be greater than 27,060.25. So in this case, we need at least 27,061 subjects. We could also do this working with means. So recall 
this example for the test scores for males and female chemistry students. So the very first thing we're going to do is start out with our margin of error formula. So recall for this example, the margin of error was equal to the following. And notice here we want to be within five points. So we're going to set this equal to five. So notice this brings us to the following. I'm going to, we know that z alpha divided by two for a 99% confidence interval is 2.576. We're still going to have times the square root of sigma squared one over n one plus sigma squared two over n two, and it's going to be equal to five. Now notice this would be very hard to solve if we have n1 and n2. So usually what we'll do in this case is we're going to assume that we have groups of equal sample size. And notice that that is given to us up here. So we're going to assume n1 is equal to n2. So the next thing we need is we need to figure out what to do for the values of sigma1 and sigma2 squared. So our formula becomes the following. So the empirical rule tells us that if we go within two standard deviations, approximately 95% of the observation. So if we look at mu minus two sigma, that should give us the smallest value and mu plus two sigma should give us the largest. So in other words, what the empirical rule tells us is we know that the range of the data should be equal to approximately mu plus two sigma minus mu minus two sigma. And again, this is coming from the fact when we have a normal distribution with mu in the center, if we go up mu plus two sigma, we go down mu minus two sigma, we know approximately 95% of the data is between those. So solving here for sigma tells us that a good estimate of sigma is equal to the range divided by four. Well, if we look up here, notice that we're interested in test scores and we're gonna assume that those test scores range anywhere from zero to 100. So the range would be 100 divided by four is equal to 25. So we're gonna use an estimate of sigma one equals sigma two, which is equal to 25. And so this is one way that you could get estimates of standard deviation is by using range. And that range will often be just based on what the allowable errors or um, values are for that particular uh, variable. So plugging that in, we have that five is equal to 2.576 times the square root of one over n times 25 squared plus 25 squared. Now, just like before, you wanna solve for n. Doing so, we'll give that n is equal to, and really, we could put the inequality here instead of the equal sign. We would get 30, 331.789. So in this case, we're gonna use n1 is equal to n2, which has to be at least 332. So notice here if the n is too large, you know, in other words, if you know it would be impossible to get samples of 332 people between each, uh, one option would be to try to get a better estimate of sigma. This can be done by maybe doing a pilot study and getting a better idea, because we know that realistically that error, or, um, that standard deviation is probably smaller than that. We could increase the alpha so instead of being 95% confident, we could just be 90, or we could allow for more error. In other words, increase that margin of error, so increase the five to some other value. And this is gonna end this note set.